The Hastings Center, especially for those of you who are new, should know that for the last 50 years, we have been examining the implications, the social implications and the ethical implications of emerging technologies and asking questions about how can we best make use of these technologies? How can we be sure that they are safe, but also beyond safety? Can we anticipate the ways in which they might have an impact on our relationships with one another? Um, what do they raise in terms of the extent to which we should manipulate the natural world or find ourselves a part of the natural world? How do we find that, how do we navigate the choices that technology gives us? And um, this has just been a 50 year through line. At our advisory council meeting this morning, we talked about how we can continue to do more of that and how we can, what we should begin to think about doing to make sure it has a ripple effect in health and science policy even, even bigger than it has been for the last 50. Um, increasingly, the technologies are hugely transformative. So many things are at stake. And so our work is more important than it's ever been. And even as they've grown in transformative power, we have not developed the social infrastructure, the governance, to go the, the, in the social infrastructure to govern the use of these technologies. And we find ourselves at this moment where we, we just don't know how to, how to use, how to tame the beast, to use, to use a, a Dan Callahan's um, metaphor. So we're increasingly looking at public engagement and the ways in which we can do deliberation and many other strategies. And you will see that that was the through line this morning, but it culminates this afternoon in the fact that we've invited somebody who's incredibly concerned about the, how, how this should be navigated, Kevin Esvelt, a professor at MIT, who's gonna be our featured speaker. It will be my great pleasure to introduce uh, Kevin Esvelt. Um, but I'm going to take a couple of minutes to forefront the significance of what he'll say and how it fits into the broader picture of the Hastings Center's mission. Um, so to start, it, it's not a stretch to say that science and technology have shaped most of modern life and indeed most of our lives. These fields continue to produce new knowledge and to create new things that often for better but sometimes for worse, it feels like we're stuck with. Uh, some of them transform society for good vaccines, biomedicines, clean water, innovations in communication and technology. Some have both pros and cons. We might think of um, the internet, AI, drones, or genetic technologies, the topic of today. And some things just seem plain scary, like new ways of conducting cyber and bio warfare. In nearly all these cases, whether the consequences are good or bad, there's a power differential between the people producing scientific knowledge and technological feats, whether in industry or academia or in government labs, and the people who wittingly or unwittingly uh, do the utilization and the buying and sometimes the suffering. With good reason, we've left a lot of science and technology up to scientists and technologists. They know what they're doing and they understand how the world works scientifically, mechanistically, and the ways in which we might be able to improve it. Uh, and this division of labor has tended to work quite well. The experts have done a pretty good job of steering us in the right direction. And government has played an important role too. They're one of the largest investors in basic research and through patenting, licensing, subsidies, and other mechanisms, attempt to ensure that the benefits of science and technology outweigh their costs. At the same time, that leaves quite a few of us billions actually around the world outside this process of creating new knowledge and technologies that will shape and structure not only our lives, our human lives, but also the planet um, and the non-human organisms in that planet. We know very little about what goes on in laboratories around the country and around the world and how benefits and costs are calculated by expert committees or bureaucrats. We might think as a narrow way of thinking about ethics and the values that are embedded in science. So the question, and I think our challenge, is rather than leave the future of science and technology, and thus really the future of human life and the planet, up to experts behind closed doors, could this be a more engaged, democratic, and transparent process? I think it should, and that's a big reason why I came to the Hastings Center in the first place. Um, actually, I should say I was just mostly surprised that they would hire me, and I couldn't say no. Um, but. Uh, 
really the Hastings Center has in its 50 year history supported and undertaken conversations in academic journals, in our books and in our reports and in public venues about the values that should guide advances in and applications of science and technology. Really this, the wise use of emerging technologies, which is one of the major program areas here, is dedicated to the, this set of questions. And really these are questions fundamentally about the kind of world that we want to live in and co-create together. This is not the exclusive domain of scientists or technologists or philosophers or bioethicists or corporations or markets. Um, it's something that we have to work on and work out together. So nearly all of the work at the Hastings Center touches on this sort of really broad landscape. Um, but I'll just mention two of the projects, um, well, to actually kinds of end up being three, but at least <laughs> two of the projects that we're working on directly here. Um, the first is a project called uh, Public Deliberation about Gene Editing in the Wild, which is a three-year project funded by the National Science Foundation that will look at how we might undertake public deliberation and involve public more meaningfully in conversations about the use of genetic technologies, including gene drives, to alter organisms in the shared environment. So examples include editing mosquitoes to reduce the um, incidence of malaria, or as Dr. Esfelt will talk about, um, engineering mice to prevent the spread of tick-borne diseases like Lyme disease. Um, and in part of this project, we'll include thinking about what sorts of institutions or infrastructure we would need to have this sort of broad public involvement and more engagement with the values that are embedded in science and technology and how we um, utilize these transformative projects, uh, technologies. So one reason I'm really excited about this is because it's premised on the idea that uh, getting people involved in decisions about the science happening in their backyards or in their airspace or in their water sources can serve as a building block for a stronger democracy. Whether what's at issue is gene editing of mice or immigration policy or any other topic, um, the idea that local engagement, civic engagement on collective projects is really key to not only making headway in science and technology, but really um, reforming and strengthening our democracy. And this is also the premise of the second project that I'll mention, which is um, called How Should the Public Learn? Reconstructing Common Purpose and Civic Innovation for a Democracy in Crisis. And this is funded by the Knight Foundation. And uh, we're gonna bring together a group of scholars from political theory, from philosophy, and from um, public deliberation more generally uh, to research ways of promoting civic learning and engagement at the local level um, with bioethical topics where we seem to be at an impasse um, in some circles. So issues like mandatory vaccination, uh, climate change and rising sea levels, and of course my own favorite, genetically modifying mosquitoes and other uh, animals. Uh, so the idea there being, again, this sort of, not necessarily local that it needs to be place-based, but face-to-face -face deliberation and encouraging critical thinking and engagement with um, science and technology is a way in to creating um, relationships with fellow citizens about the kind of world that we want to create. And Millie already mentioned this, but I want to highlight um, a second thing that we've done recently, which was our summer workshop with high school teachers to teach um, high school teachers how to introduce bioethics in their science classes. Um, and this is sort of premised on the idea that um, Doing science responsibly and responsibly requires training future scientists to be aware of the ethical dimensions of their work. And also um, that people, future non-scientists are equipped to really critically think about science and technology and also have some practice having serious conversations about value disagreements. Um, so we're hoping that the next generation will be good at this, better than us. Um, but also appreciate that it takes a lot of skill and practice to cultivate that kind of critical thinking in addition to scientific literacy. So we're working to um, expand this program so that um, we might have a bigger impact across middle schools and high schools around the country. Um, we've invited Dr. Esfelt today in part because his approach to doing science and to governing science manifests the Hastings Center's commitment to the wise development of emerging technologies. I know he has way more suggestions um, about how to open up science and to make it more responsive and accountable to the public's interest and preferences. 
and I'm excited for him to share them with us today. And so finally, my, my real task, which is just to introduce Kevin. Uh, Kevin Esfeldt is an assistant professor at MIT's Media Lab and director of MIT's Sculpting Evolution Group. After receiving his PhD at Harvard for inventing a synthetic microbial ecosystem to rapidly evolve useful biomolecules, he held two fellowships at Harvard and helped pioneer the development of CRISPR, uh, the CRISPR method of genome editing. In 2013, Esfeldt was the first to identify the potential for CRISPR gene drive systems to alter wild populations of organisms. And recently, he and his research group uh, developed a new form of technology called daisy drives, which would let communities aiming to prevent diseases alter wild organisms and local ecosystems safely. An advocate of open science to accelerate, accelerate discovery and improve safety, he seeks to use gene drives as a catalyst to reform the scientific ecosystem. By carefully developing and testing these methods with openness and humility, Dr. Esfeldt and his colleagues seek to address difficult ecological problems for the benefit of humanity and the natural world. And also by emphasizing universal safeguards and early transparency, he has worked to ensure that community discussions always precede and guide the development of technologies that will impact the shared environment. Kevin, thanks for being here. <laughs> So thank you for the very kind introduction. It's a great honor to be here. And I will have to say that I don't feel particularly expert in anything. I suppose there may be something to the notion that when, as you become expert in something, you realize just how vast your ignorance truly is. And that's how I feel about more and more things these days. So an early topic of this, of this talk was going to be this focus on the natural world. And who says, we should alter the natural world and why and how do we make these crucial decisions that will infect everyone? How are these technologies different from others? But given the mission of the Hastings Center about the wise development of emerging technologies, we decided it was perhaps more appropriate to, to go up, to take the eagle's eye view and look at the challenges facing our society broadly through the lens of the particular problems that we are working on. So first, let's say the obvious. Technology is power. The extent to which we as a species have utterly dominated this planet and multiplied far beyond any other species, any other single species, have reshaped the entire planetary environment is because of technology. And those societies of people that have greater access to technology have correspondingly more power to enforce their will upon others. Since everything we do is affected by technology and it is power, the reality is that is only going to increase. The primary determinant of the future of our civilization will be the technologies that we choose to invent insofar as we get to choose and the wisdom with which we decide whether, when, and how to use them. I like mythology. And I like especially mixing mythology because often different cultures have interesting glimpses of perhaps a shared truth. This is a depiction of Yggdrasil, the world tree that joins all the realms of existence. But I think of it as also being similar to the tree of knowledge for Yggdrasil has fruit. And what we as a society are doing is we are ascending the great world tree and we are tasting its fruit. The question is, who chooses which fruits we taste? My personal experience in this is that you taste whichever fruit looks pretty tasty. Five or, five or so years ago, I was involved in developing CRISPR, which is this molecular scalpel we can use to edit genes. And I was walking through this beautiful garden in the Emerald Necklace in Boston. It was actually it was part of my commute then, it was very nice. And I saw, happened to see a turtle in the water, which is pretty rare. And there were some ducks and there were some geese and some birds flying overhead. And it was a lovely spring day. And I wondered, are we ever going to use CRISPR to edit any of these things? And I concluded, probably not. Because whenever we edit an organism, we reduce its ability to survive and reproduce in the wild. And natural selection is ruthless. It eliminates anything that does not actively enhance survival and reproduction. If we divert resources, we're detracting from the animal's ability to reproduce. Never has 
any human alteration made by selective breeding or by genome editing been shown to confer an advantage in the ancestral habitat. That is, no engineered organism, no human altered organism has ever outcompeted the wild equivalent in the, in, in the wild. But then I wondered, well, wait a minute. What if, instead of just using CRISPR to edit the genome, what if we made CRISPR heritable? And this is what led me to wonder about the wisdom of what we're doing. Always takes a little bit of humor when you're, gonna, when you're going to embark upon a, a, some deep topics. So I try to take what we're doing in a grain of salt. And one way to do that is to read comics. So a great web comic, which you may or may not have read, is called XKCD, and it's written by someone who lives in Somerville. And it's about science and math and humor and philosophy and so forth. And here we have a lovely one about the risks of research. This is probably the most applicable XKCD to the mission of Hastings. Because what this does is it plots different fields of research on the risk of your research being used by a supervillain for world domination against the risk of the thing you're studying breaking free from your facility and threatening the local population. And you have all kinds of different fields here. So this was made for researchers such as myself to evaluate how risky are the things that you're doing. Well, my group does robotics and microbiology in support primarily of genetic engineering. Huh. <laughs> Maybe we should be cautious. But that thing I thought of five years ago was a way of using CRISPR to accomplish gene drive, which is a naturally occurring phenomenon that lets a gene spread through a population even if it doesn't help the organism reproduce. Evolution invented it a very long time ago, but with CRISPR, we can now harness it. And what that means is that we can genetically engineer not just individual organisms in the lab, we can engineer them such that if released into the wild, they will spread that change through the wild population. Which means that my group doesn't only work with these things in the top right. If genetic engineering has pride of place in the top right there, and I'm not really sure it does, I happen to think artificial general intelligence probably is way off the charts in, on both axes. But wherever genetic engineering is, gene drive is further up into the right. So how does it work? Well, the basic insight is you have the genome you want to edit, and you have a change you want to put in, your desired change. Instead of just cutting the genome with CRISPR and inserting the desired genes, instead encode the instructions for making that change. So now you have your desired change and the CRISPR components. Put this in the reproductive cells of an organism. CRISPR is going to cut the target site in the genome very precisely, and it's going to copy in the new DNA. Now this cell has the instructions for making the CRISPR components to accomplish this genome edit. So it's going to cut the other chromosome, because recall that we have two chromosomes in most organisms, and copy itself over. So now this organism has two copies. And here's where the real magic happens. If this engineered gene drive organism mates with a wild counterpart, then all of the offspring are guaranteed to inherit the edited version. And in the reproductive cells of those offspring, CRISPR is going to cut again. It's going to cut the wild type copy, and again, this is in the reproductive cells, and copy itself over. And that means that when these organisms mate with wild type counterparts, they are going to pass on the edited copy, and genome editing happens again, and again, and again, and again until eventually, given enough generations, you have edited every member of that population connected by gene flow. If all the populations of a species are connected by gene flow everywhere in the world, and you've designed this correctly to be evolutionarily stable, you will have edited the entire species. Now, if you're an inventor, speaking from experience, you focus initially, at least, on the potential benefits. So when I thought of this, I thought, well, wait a minute, this is a form of gene drive, because I'm an evolutionary biologist, that was in my field, I thought of that. And wait a minute, this is the form of gene drive that uses DNA scissors to copy itself. That's just like this form in yeast via ISKE-1. And then I thought, wait a minute, hasn't, didn't I see a paper about a team trying to use natural homing endonuclease DNA scissors to spread genes in mosquitoes? Something about halting malaria, so I looked it up and discovered that yes, in fact, that's what they were doing. Problem was, those scissors don't work very well. CRISPR is a whole nother matter. So what could we do with it? Well, the initial thought was, 
malaria. Now, <clears throat> malaria, of course, is one of the great plagues of the world right now. 200 million in people infected every single year. More than 400,000 people die, the vast majority of them children under the age of five. In the time I've been speaking, perhaps 10 children have died of malaria. So this is an overwhelming, urgent problem. But it's not the only one. If you're a creative inventor, you can think of all kinds of problems that your technology, like a hammer, everything starts looking like a nail. And in this case, this is a reasonably powerful one. So in fact, there are potentially a lot of other things we can do. Malaria gets a lot of attention, but there are other diseases that are nearly as bad. Does anyone have care to guess what this organism is? Yes. Great call. This is, a, this is Schistosoma hematobium, which is one of the two human schistosome species, causes schistosomiasis. 250 million infections, we think, very possibly more. Somewhere between probably 20 and 50,000 deaths. We're not sure exactly because it's a much more chronic condition. But in some ways, it's worse than malaria because this also affects children and people. They tend to get reinfected even though we have drugs that will cure people for pennies. They just get reinfected in the environment because it's a waterborne disease. And it causes lifelong growth and in many cases, cognitive stunting. So this is a blight that affects generations for the rest of their lives. We can move on. What about the environment? This is a, this is a ship rat eating a endangered bird in Aotearoa, New Zealand. <coughs> Rodents as a whole are the number one cause of extinction on islands. And one species of rat does an estimated $20 billion of economic damage in the United States alone every single year. So they're a huge economic pest, they're a huge environmental source of destruction. And so we try to kill them. And our primary means of killing them is poison and they die in agony over days from the poisons that we use. Rats are very intelligent creatures, and we kill billions of them with poison every single year. That's something of an animal welfare travesty. What if, instead, we could control them genetically? We ensured they didn't reproduce as much. Consequently, those problematic rats and mice in areas where we cared about just would not even be born. Cats. Cats are the number two cause of extinction on islands. As a single species, they're number one, but the rodents collectively outdo them. I have a cat. I love my cat. He's caught a mouse once or twice that managed to get into the house. And what he did to that mouse was not pretty. If I were a mouse, I would rather be taken by a hawk or just about anything, maybe even poison, rather than be taken by a cat. Um, it's best described as torture. And if you calculate the numbers of cats, both indoor, outdoor, that are people's pets, and ferals, and you estimate over the whole world, given how often we know they kill things, you're probably at 10 billion animals torture murdered every year by cats. Millions of kittens on the side of the cats themselves starve and freeze in the wild. And we spend quite a lot of money on animal shelters and adopting cats, trying to prevent this from happening. And our best tool is this trap, neuter, release. It doesn't work very well. It's also not all that humane. How would you like if an alien kidnapped you, castrated you, and then put you back? Wouldn't you rather just be born and not be fertile, if that was what it was going to come to? I would. We might be able to do that. Here's the hardest question. Does anyone know what this is? It's a fly. You don't know what kind of fly? No? It's a bot fly. This is Cochleomyia hominivorax. This is the only species of fly that lays its eggs in open wounds, and the maggots eat their way through the living flesh. It's an economic pest. It's only present in South America now because we already eradicated it from North America. It causes about $3.5 billion in damages every year, concentrated on rural communities that can least afford it. And it devours one billion mammals alive every single year. This is one of those rare ones where we can't say what's going to happen to our civilization. But if we don't do anything about this, given the typical lifespan of a species, it's probably going to stick around for a million more years. That's 10 to the 15th animals eaten alive in agony. And we know how bad it is because it's called the hominivorax for a reason. It infests people. 
and the pain is so agonizing you have to give them morphine before doctors can even examine the wound. That's how bad this is. We didn't make this pest. Nature made it. But we have the power to do something about it. And that means that if we decline, then the moral burden of all that future suffering is on us. That's what it does to animals. It literally eats them alive from the inside. There are a few more gruesome and horrifying things about the natural world than this species. And an inventor, again, is going to say, yes, if we intervene, we are responsible for the consequences. But if we choose not to intervene, then we are responsible for the consequences of doing nothing. The crushing burden of responsibility is on us no matter what. And that is the cost of being one of the people privileged enough to make discoveries in new forms of technology, new ways of exerting power. Skeptics, on the other hand, worry about unintended consequences. They say that's all very well and good, but what about if things go wrong? Do, in the case of something like gene drive, do we understand the ecosystem well enough? What's the role of the target species? What about ecological tipping points? Jeff Gore at MIT has done some great work on this. We can't predict these systems well enough to know when there might be a tipping point. This is gonna to have to be evaluated case by case. This is not something that's inherent to the technology. But we can ask, well, what about this CRISPR gene drive technology? Could it be weaponized? This was something that we carefully considered before telling the world it was possible. And the answer is no, they're not a major security threat. And that's because they spread slowly over generations. You can always detect them by sequencing, you can't hide them. And once you see one, you can always know how to build the counter. You just build another one that cuts and replaces the first one. CRISPR is so versatile, you can always do this. It is impossible to build a gene drive that cannot be cut and replaced by another one, as best we can tell. And the very first thing we tested, when we did test in the lab later, was that this was true, and it is. But there are other potential problems, things that might go wrong. How invasive are these things? Well, we did some modeling of this and found that they're highly invasive. It takes very few organisms to take off. It takes very little gene flow between populations to have one spread, at least for alteration drives, and we're currently doing the modeling on suppression drives. They look pretty invasive too. And given that, can we even run field trials? And on the full power self-propagating gene drive, the answer would seem to be no. So we stood up and said so, and that got some publicity because it's not very often that the inventor of a technology says, whoa, maybe we shouldn't use this at least not in that form. I had recommended that this might be suitable for conservation, and I said, no, that was wrong. I shouldn't have suggested that, because conservation, if you want to take out an invasive species, there's the invasive population, but there's also the native population somewhere else. Will people move gene drive organisms without permission? Yes, of course they will. These are people. People follow their incentives. Look at the case of Aotearoa, New Zealand. Australia, which loves to tinker with viruses to try to wipe out their invasive species, came up with Khaleesi virus, which has no relation to Game of Thrones. <laughs> it kills rabbits very effectively. They imported it into Australia to test it on Wardang Island, which is where they'd done the same for myxomatosis a few decades earlier. What they didn't know is it was spread by bot flies that could move between Wardang and the mainland. So it spread to mainland Australia. Farmers from all over Australia drove up there to grab the dead and dying rabbits and took them back to their farms and throw them in the burrows because rabbits are an economic pest. Of course they wanted to get rid of their rabbits. New Zealand said this was not a good, appropriately controlled trial and banned import of Khaleesi virus into New Zealand. Guess what New Zealand farmers did? They smuggled it in. And rabbits only do about somewhere between seven and 30 million dollars of damage a year in New, New Zealand agriculture. Rats do 20 billion in the United States. You think people wouldn't move a gene drive rat to deal with that if you're a poultry producer? Of course they would. Could unauthorized spread spark a powerful social backlash? Well, you tell me if you saw this on the television. Entire species turned to GMOs. Lab escape spreads like wildfire. Is CRISPR to blame? Now, to be clear, we can't know for sure that these things will spread. That's what the models suggest. That's what the small-scale laboratory cage tests suggest. Doesn't mean they actually will, but how can you find out for sure without actually testing it, and if you test it, and then, well, it's gonna do that. You can't know. You just have to be cautious. So, this is why 
among other reasons, we decided to go ahead and tell the world that this was possible before we did any research in the lab and to outline the necessary laboratory safeguards that would be required and call for regulation. And when another group independently developed it without using those safeguards, we talked to them and a bunch of other scientists and agreed to publish a paper recommending that everyone use appropriate safeguards, those that we originally recommended. My group now also has focused on developing localized versions of gene drive that don't spread indefinitely because you, you want to give communities the ability to affect, to solve their own problems without forcing their solution on anyone else. The more narrow and local you can make it, up to ideally letting every individual choose, the better from an ethical perspective. So we've been trying to do that and our best in, in theory version would let one town alter its own, maybe one neighborhood alter its own population and have natural selection act to weed out any engineered ones that cross the boundary. So that's all lovely, and if you're a skeptic, you can do all that, but if you're an ethicist, like many of you here, I imagine, then you probably ask about what are the normative implications of doing this? And I'm going to commit the colossal sin of not even discussing humanity's appropriate relationship with the natural world, which is a very important topic, but we're talking about other things. And I'm going to focus on what this means for human communities and questions of equity and justice. Bluntly, this technology is different from traditional biotech and medicine. Because if we develop a new pharmaceutical, it goes through the normal approval process, your doctor recommends it to you, you can say no. You can always decline. You can opt out of the effects of our invention if we're just making something that is a product on the market. Yes, there are edge cases that become so ubiquitous you have effectively no choice, but those are edge cases. Certainly for biotech, you can always opt out. But you can't opt out of changes to the shared environment. So if we don't tell people what we're thinking of doing at the earliest stages of research, when you can actually change direction and choose different options, then you're denying people a voice in decisions intended to affect them that they won't be able to opt out of. And I think that's wrong. So the National Academies agreed but they also stopped short of actually suggesting that sci scientists share their plans at an early stage. They just put in the nice sentence agreeing. We'll come back to that problem. Even if other groups don't necessarily do it, we try to do the right thing. We pre-register all of our gene drive experiments, and in fact, all of our experiments involving any technology for ecological engineering. We also make all of our grant proposals involving any of those technologies public as soon as they're submitted so that people can see the details of what we're proposing to do and inviting comment. And I have not exactly been shy about telling the world that I think that this is, in fact, the morally correct thing to do and advocating for using this as a lever to make science more open. But even that is not enough. You still, we still need better models of what community-guided science actually means. So this is what led to the Mice Against Ticks project. And the goal of Mice Against Ticks was to try community-driven science from the earliest stages, giving the community technological options to choose from, and not actually beginning the research until you hear from them as to what they want. And we deliberately chose two of the best educated and most politically privileged islands in the world, Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. And there are several reasons for this, but one major one is New England town hall democracy. People here have a tradition of making these decisions locally for, on behalf of the community. And that tradition doesn't exist everywhere. Happily, it exists near here. And these communities have a problem, which is tick-borne disease. This is an ecological problem we created. In brief, um, you have the, you have the um, Cary Institute just down the road looking at this as to the details. But in brief, ecological changes that we make, we like forests. We plant lots of forests. The Northeast is more forested than ever. But we like living in it, so we carve it up with roads and houses. That maximizes forest perimeter. We also get rid of most of the wolves and the other predators of deer, so the deer population skyrockets. Also, the mice, the white-footed mice, which are the best reservoir of disease, prefer edges more than forest interiors, meaning we've just flipped the ratio of things that ticks bite. We've maximized the number of deer, which maximizes the number of ticks. We've also maximized the number of mice, which are the best reservoir of disease. So you get a lot of mice that then 
infect all the ticks, which infect the mice and so forth. So you end up with most of those mice being infected, which means most of those ticks being infected, and there's a lot more ticks than there used to be, and you have a Lyme disease epidemic. We made this problem. So the question is, can we fix it? This is an ecological cycle. What is the smallest possible change we might do to, to disrupt this cycle of transmission? Well, it would be immunize the tick, but no one really wants to be bitten by a genetically engineered tick. Let's get real. Uh, also, ticks are fiendishly hard to engineer. So instead, we're working to immunize the mice. That was the idea. And the key to this is consult the communities on preferred technology development options. We, let them, we gave them a bunch of different options, immunize against Lyme, immunize against ticks. Use native antibodies, look at alternative methods. Introduce by releasing a lot of mice, introduce by trying to do some form of local drive system. Use only native mouse DNA, or okay to use synthetic DNA, or okay to use DNA from other species. And only once they gave us answers as to their preferences for those did we begin doing research. And what we're doing, broadly speaking, is vaccinate mice, find those that are most resistant, do B cell sorting, find the antibodies that makes these mice resistant, what, which antibodies are protective, make recombinant ones in the lab, see how good they are. Once we've identified several highly protective antibodies, then encode them in the reproductive cells of the mice so that they produce them from birth and pass that immunity down to their offspring. That doesn't normally happen, but the source of the immunity would be white-footed mice, and this was what the communities had requested. Don't do anything that isn't normally in a mouse if you can possibly help it. So that's what we're doing. We've not only gone to those original meetings, but we've also checked back frequently with the communities to try to raise awareness and invite people to share their concerns in particular and inviting vocal skepticism and suggestions of what might go wrong and things that we should look at. And we've been fortunate to get a lot of major media coverage so that a lot of people know about this project, although it's still remarkable how few people actually know about something, no matter how much media coverage you get. It's a very biased perspective. And on the governance side, we're still figuring this out, but each island has the boards of health chose appointed steering committees to, in effect, tell us what to do. Um, they're also working on coming up with a data safety monitoring board, which is a group of independent experts to evaluate the results and deliver a report to the community and decide whether to proceed. And here's an example of Nantucket's current steering committee. And on each steering committee, there is a vocal skeptic whose explicit job is to channel the concerns of other members of the community who might not be willing to talk directly to us or to stand up in a town hall with a bunch of people who have suffered from Lyme disease and say, wait a minute, I'm not so sure about this. Because we want to hear from every possible concern. Our overall goal for this, though, is not just to do the right thing and solve Lyme disease. I mean, Lyme disease is a horrible, it's a horrible problem that destroys lives, but it's not on the order of malaria. And some of the things we'll talk about later are much worse than malaria. But it's very important that we promote norms of community-guided research with shared impacts, because wisdom is a collective virtue. And one important check on science going wrong is having to check in with a community of people who actually would be impacted by those results. So we've had the inventor's perspective, the skeptic's perspective, and the ethicist's perspective. But there's one more, which is that of the realist. And the realist says, that's so sweet. You're trying to do the right thing. Isn't that lovely? Well, that's not how humans work, you see. You're trying to do the right thing because you happen to be at a place, the MIT Media Lab, where your incentives are very different from those of a traditional scientist. And despite your trying to do the right thing and consequently getting a lot of media coverage for it, which is one reason why you're doing it, and you get rewarded for that the way other scientists don't, no one has actually done anything to change the major incentives governing other scientists. And if you expect scientists to, sudden, to somehow copy your example just because you get a lot of attention, that's not what they get rewarded for. They get rewarded for publishing papers. They need funding, recognition, career advancement, and they need it to be legal. Unless you change one of those factors, you're not gonna get a change in how scientists work. Scientists are encouraged to publish papers and basically nothing else. The most open-minded scientific department, in general, will tolerate its members doing things other than trying to get papers into science and nature. Tolerate. It's viewed as, well, you probably shouldn't because you're wasting your time. We're not going to reward you for it. We're not going to punish you for it. Many departments will punish, especially junior faculty, for even trying. 
That's just not what science is about, you see. It's about accumulating knowledge. Communicators are actively looked down on. This is the Carl Sagan effect. Very unjustified with respect to the late Dr. Sagan, but unfortunately, that's how people view it. If you talk to the public, you must not be a very serious scientist now, right? Real scientists are dedicated. Worst of all, we are encouraged to keep our plans a secret from everybody else. And that's because we're rewarded with publication. If we let slip our brilliant idea, somebody else throws more money and hands at the problem, gets it working first, publishes first, they get all the credit and we get nothing. And so the very rational response is don't tell anybody what you're thinking of doing. Don't tell anybody what you're actively working on. Don't tell anybody anything until it's, until it's accepted for publication. And that's a problem. Because does anyone really think that if you were designing a scientific enterprise from scratch, would you really set it up, if you wanted fast progress above all else, would you really set it up encouraging all of the different actors to keep everything they're doing a secret from everyone else and never share their information? Of course not. No one in their right mind would set up scientific incentives that way. So I have very little patience for these arguments of, oh, well, science is great and hallowed tradition and so forth. Science evolved, culturally speaking, back when information sharing was costly. And around a couple decades back, the cost of sharing information dropped to literally zero. That's a pretty profound change, and we have not changed the cultural incentives governing science to deal with that accordingly. It's also a bit of a disaster when it comes to safety. So here is one of the most terrifying logical principles that I've read recently. This is in a paper by Nick Bostrom a couple years ago, and he calls it the unilateralist curse. Suppose that any one agent in a group can take an action that will affect all of the others. And there's a whole bunch of different actions that they can take, but they all have collective shared impact. What is going to define the set of actions that actually occur? Well, it's the equivalent of governance by the most risk tolerant agent on every possible issue. Because if one person decides to go ahead with it, decides that it's worth it, decides that it's worth it to them personally, never mind the cost of any, ever, to everyone else, that they're optimistic about the benefits with respect to the risks, they're going to do it. And in the absence of greater governing, governance and coordination, you have governance by whichever is willing. This is how technology is currently governed. This is how the single source of power that determines what our civilization will be in the future is governed by the unilateralist curse. Because scientists develop new technologies on their own in small groups of similarly trained specialists. That's what we face. But it's even worse than Bostrom outlined because he focused on risk tolerance. But even a very risk averse agent may just not be aware of the negative consequences. They just may never have thought of it. And this was driven home to me because as I mentioned, another research group, after we had published, they hadn't seen our work, hadn't seen our suggestions that people use appropriate laboratory safeguards and the like. They independently developed CRISPR gene drive as a laboratory tool without realizing that it might spread in the wild. They were not evolutionary biologists. They had never heard of a gene drive. They just wanted to make two copies of a mutation very quickly in the lab. And they thought of this as a great way to do that, because it is. They didn't think about the implications for potential wild populations and escape thereof. Nor about public perception, as you can tell from their title. Now, they joined us later on to on recommends that everyone use safeguards, but the point is these were brilliant and well-meaning scientists, and they just couldn't reliably anticipate the consequences of their work. They just didn't have expertise in the relevant field. We should not have expected them to. That's not something we can reasonably expect. The world is too complicated. There's too many different fields. You can't catch everything on your own. Worse, we were aware that this was something that was likely to happen, that this, was, this particular application as a lab tool was something they might want to do, and that it was most likely to happen in fruit flies, which is one of the highest risk species of, of accidental spread. 
And so we tried to warn the fruit fly community, and that's one reason why we got a lot of media coverage and so forth of gene drive. Didn't matter. They still didn't see it. And the very fact that six years ago, no one imagined that researchers might be able to unilaterally edit entire species should be proof positive that technology can advance very suddenly in unexpected directions. Because the very idea of editing an entire wild species was completely absent even from science fiction just six years ago. I don't know what's next. Nobody does. That's the problem. So to restate our overall problem, technological power and accessibility are increasing. Keep in mind that gene drive is potentially a unilateral technique. One person can do it on their own if they know how. And most research is conducted in secret by small groups of similarly trained specialists who can't reliably anticipate the consequences of what they're doing or be identified and warned by anyone who might happen to. So if we suppose that there exists somewhere on our world tree a technological fruit accessible to us whose discovery and dissemination would threaten civilization itself, right now, the current research enterprise is highly likely to stumble right into it. We have basically no safeguards against that at all. So what would I like to see researchers ask? I don't think there is a perfect solution. Life isn't easy that way. But for a partial list, first, does the very knowledge of the technology that it exists, that, it, the, that doing it is possible at all, is that an information hazard? Is that true information that if disseminated could cause harm or would cause harm? If so, then you need to be much more careful about how you go about it because the number one most logical thing to do if you're not certain about the consequences of what you're doing and whether it's a good idea is to ask somebody else for advice because again, Wisdom is a collective virtue. But if it's an information hazard sufficiently severe, you need to be very careful about telling anyone else. So what are the other questions you need to ask? Could this technology either accidentally or deliberately inflict mass harm? That could be direct physical harm, ecological harm, or it could be social harm. How accessible is it likely to be, both initially and as development advances? Is it something that can be used, deployed unilaterally by one single actor? How long will it take for someone else to discover it if you say nothing? This is the hard one. Can defenses be developed in the meantime? If this is something that is, that is a weapon, are there ways that we can block it? How much research would it take to do that? What's your best guess? How will the development synergize with other technologies? This is the really hard one. And perhaps most important, will it change research incentives in our overall technological path? Because even if defenses are possible, what if those defenses cause us to go down a route we don't necessarily want to? There's a lot of question about biodefense research. How much of it is actually dual use? Sometimes we don't want to have to develop a defense because that defense can very easily become offense. How serious is this? Please understand that I cannot tell you. I can only give salient examples from history, and more on that later. But just to read letters from 100 years ago from a camp in Massachusetts, it is horrible. One can stand it to see one, two, or 20 men die, but to see these poor devils dropping like flies sort of gets on your nerves. We've been averaging about 100 deaths per day and still keeping it up. It takes special trains to carry away the dead. For several days, there were no coffins, and the bodies piled up something fierce. We used to go down to the morgue, which is just back of my ward, and look at the boys laid out in long rows. It beats any sight they ever had in France after a battle. The 1918 influenza pandemic is the reason why even the Great War did not kill as many humans as did pathogens. The first time we ever managed that feat was World War II. It killed 50 million people. So would it do that again? If it became a pandemic, very likely. 
So what prevents someone from releasing it? Well, number one, there's a select agent list, which is a list of organisms, viruses, bacteria, and a few crop pests that are deemed potential bioweapons by the US government and, broadly speaking, several other governments. And it's very, very hard to get a hold of these samples. You have to undergo background checks. You have to, there's screening, ultra-tight laboratory security requirements, and so forth, because these are potentially dangerous. And it's hard to make because 80% of DNA synthesis firms screen their orders and won't make this from scratch for you. I hope you're pausing at that. Wait a minute. 80% of DNA synthesis firms screen their orders and won't make it. So 20% will? Yes, in fact, they will. Now you might say, well, wait a minute. Why do we know the sequence of this? Well, because science. Of course we had to know the sequence of it. So here is the sequence of one segment of 1918 influenza. And if you go online, you can look up the others. It was the key papers for remaking it. First one was in 1999, rescue of influenza A virus from recombinant DNA. Point being, influenza is an eight segment R negative strand RNA virus. If you make the relevant strands, it will self-assort and boot up in an appropriate cell. Um, sometimes, well, I'm not gonna say anymore because details can be hazardous. But point being, that tells you how to do it. And then in 2005, a CDC group reported the characterization of the reconstructed 1918 Spanish influenza pandemic virus. They reported the whole genome sequence and they reported that they had remade it. And they were surprised that it killed basically all of the mice that it infected. Why is it all public? Why was it done at all? Well, if you read some editorials from Science that came out at the same time, Phil Sharp said, it is reassuring that the NSAB, which is the board on biosafety and biosecurity established in the wake of the anthrax attacks, was asked to consider these papers before publication and concluded that the scientific benefit of the future use of this information far outweighs the potential risk of misuse. People may be reassured that the system is working because <coughs> agencies representing the public, the scientific community, and the publishing journals were involved in the decision. Oh, really? Because I'm not very reassured. And even more so, the editor-in-chief of science at the time asked whether they would have gone ahead and published, even if NSAB had said otherwise, had advised against it, said, so would I, given our own convictions, the timing and what we had learned from our consultations, have published the paper, even if the NSAB had voted otherwise? Absolutely. Unless they had it classified as a national security concern. So we as a society have decided that every human with an internet connection should be able to freely access the genome of every virus ever sequenced. Note that they could have done a sort of limited need to know basis release whereby the sequence would be available to influenza researchers who went through the appropriate background checks and so forth. But no, information wants to be free. And they'd made this decision at a time when it was very clear, in fact, it's been clear for a very long time that DNA synthesis would get easier and easier. And there has never been a time when 100% of DNA synthesis was screened for pathogens and hazardous sequences. It's easy to order synthetic DNA that isn't screened. It gets cheaper every day. And more and more individuals have the laboratory skills that can turn synthetic DNA into something nasty. Most importantly, Discussions of risk on this topic, in case you think that I'm perhaps a bit of a reactionary. To be clear, I am biased. I personally must hold myself morally responsible for CRISPR gene drive, and no matter what anyone does with it, if it's something I could reasonably have said something to prevent, it's on me. So I'm probably biased in being overly cautious in this. But you have to keep in mind that discussions of risks of this type can never be fully informed. I'm wary of even just telling you what I just told you. But anyone who knows of a potentially catastrophic technological risk, and mind you, 1918 influenza would kill 100, 150 million people. It'd be the greatest catastrophe in human history, but there are worse. Can't confirm or deny how many worse things there are if the number is greater than zero or not, but one can readily imagine things that are worse. But anyone who has imagined such a thing that seems plausible to them 
can't exactly warn the world because that information is a severe information hazard. That's the definition of an information hazard. If you see a way to do something more dangerous than remake 1918 influenza. So I don't have any good answers for what to do about this. All I can say is that the system is unbelievably broken right now. And we need to do what we can to fix it while we can. But there are several classes of partial solution. You really just need to change scientific norms and incentives. Number one, most scientists have never heard of an information hazard. The notion that information can be hazardous is somewhat antithetical to scientific dogma. But we need to be aware of that and stop doing things like citing papers that constitute obvious information hazards. For example, there is a Wikipedia page that collates most of the, I shouldn't say most, a number of hazards that really should not be detailed out there. And because it's Wikipedia, it helpfully cites the primary technical literature on the way to accomplish all of the nasty things. That's what our society thinks is the right thing to do. And the people at Wikipedia editors, it's not just up to them, the biosecurity community routinely cites serious threats as justification for their own existence and their further salaries, of course. Because how can you, we're back to the problem. If I can't tell, give you hard evidence that there is a reason to be concerned, then why would you believe me? They face that same dilemma and always have. And even with doing that note, people have not taken them seriously as evidenced by the fact that every virus ever sequenced is accessible to every human with an internet connection. So we need to stop citing and linking to information hazards. That just becomes, needs to become a norm, it needs to be frowned upon. Journal editors in particular need to, need to do that. On the oversight side, this is where things like Mice Against Ticks come in. The more scientists in general consult with local communities before developing applications that might affect those people, I don't care if it's social media or gene drive, you should still ask people who will be affected, who might use it, what they think. That's just good corporate practice, among other things, if you're developing a product. Academics should do it too. Then you at least have a greater chance of something being caught. But perhaps most important, we really need to test new models of science. But it would be reckless to try to change the incentives for all of science at once, even were it practical. So we need to test it out in particular subfields. So I'm enthused at the prospect of open review in fields such as gene drive, where we've already mostly evaluated for information hazards. We know it's not much of a weapons threat. There it's probably safe to require open public pre-registration of all gene drive research plans. So everyone in the world can take a look, see what people are doing, voice their opinions at a stage when it actually matters, and highlight anything that might go wrong. Gene drive is also unique in that it's hard to see how you make a profit out of it, especially if such a sensitive area, so we don't really have the intellectual property concerns that would plague other fields. But for other fields where those things are a problem, and where there might be many more information hazards, you would want confidential review. Now scientists worship, well, that's perhaps the wrong word. Um, we revere the, pr the practice of peer review. But why is peer review at the end of a project? Part of it is suggesting improvements to the work. But those suggestions would be most useful at the beginning. So if you want faster science, again, you would not set it up such that everything is a secret. But even if you can't change that, you would still want to encourage people to send it out to a few peers who are not going to compete with them, or could be bound not to compete with them because there'd be a record that they were consulted, for example, who could then offer their advice early and who might have the ability to catch potential hazards early enough to actually do something about it. But to summarize, technology is only getting more powerful, it's getting more accessible, and certainly in the realm of biotech, we are seeing many instances in which it's becoming increasingly unilateral. What's more, in any field, the decision to publicize a technology and describe how it works can be a near on unilateral decision. You can throw a manuscript on the internet without getting permission from an editor and a bunch of peer reviewers. It doesn't have to be in a journal. You can just throw it out there and tweet about it. But that's going to become a problem. It already is a problem. It's only going to become more so. 
and at some level of technological destructiveness, institutions that discuss safety only after the fact, which very accurately describes the history of our civilization, are best described as broken. So let's do what we can to fix it. Thanks go to our funders and especially to MIT and the Media Lab for giving me a different set of incentives such that I can talk about these things. And especially to my own research group who have not only done the bulk of the work from what I've talked about, but have also knowingly put their careers at risk by sharing their ideas in fields such as gene drive and risking being scooped and acting against their incentives. So they're the true heroes in this, not me. I like the Hastings Center's mission because I think it aligns with the challenge ahead of us. We are ascending the world tree, the tree of knowledge, and we have no choice. You might get the impression from my talk that I'm skeptical of whether we should proceed with technology development. We have no choice. Civilization is not sustainable. We are morally responsible for all of the suffering and horror that we could have prevented once we gain the power. But if we just want to stay where we are, we have to continue to innovate and invent because the resource base of the world cannot support us right now. So we must continue. The current region of the tree that we occupy doesn't produce enough fruit to sustain us. So we have to move on. We have to taste more fruit. We just need to wisely decide which branches to ascend because this is an evolutionary process. It depends on the fitness landscape and the incentives and what society rewards, what we believe that we need for new technologies. And our best hope of sculpting the evolution of technology is by recognizing what those incentives are and doing our best to change them. Thank you. Thank you so much.